Thanks, Dr. Rob, for being here again tonight. We already have some questions lining up, so. Well, let me just say hello to everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm, uh, thank you, Tammy. Tammy is my co-host of the most with the most, and I really <laughs> appreciate your taking your own recovery time to do this. Um, I do want to point out just for me personally, Tammy, that my orchid is now flowering. Oh, that's and beautiful. Good, huh? Right? Yes. So I'm just, none of you guys know, but orchids are hard to grow. and I just, They are very hard to grow. I can get them to grow. So if you have dead orchids that someone gave you and you've shoved it under a shelf somewhere, send it to Tammy. We'll put them together. Make them live and send it back to you. Don't um, send them to me. I had to dump um, a plant that is hardy and is supposed to be almost impervious to killing, and I had to throw it away today because I killed it again. So I'm so sorry. Well, you're, I am not a plant You're a great person. mom anyway. Um, so I'm let me tell you folks why we do this. This is volunteer work for us. Um, I am here every Monday night at five o'clock California time. I'm here every Friday. I'm uh, online every Friday night on intherooms.com at six o'clock California time. Mm -hmm. And that is just one of the, I guess, a whole bunch of probably 12 or 14 drop in groups, webinars and stuff that we're offering at Section Relationship Healing. And um, we don't charge you for it. We mostly have volunteers. We pay some of our therapists to manage the rooms. We, uh, I believe, and this is just how all this works, that some of you will want to be in treatment with me or in one of my programs. And if, you know, 5% of the people come on the website, come and get some help, they'll pay for everybody else to get help. And to me, that's the way capitalism is supposed to work. So I'm really excited um, about the work that we get to do for free. And, um, and just to mention it, I think I'm doing a two week intensive in yes. April. No, starting March 31st. March 31st. For men only. I'm doing an eight. Uh, I think we're up to eight. We're be eight people, eight, nine, or nine the most um, residential two week intensive. And I don't do them personally as much anymore. I don't practice that much. I'm usually opening programs. So if one of you has a great need or your spouse says, you got to go see that guy, um, I am doing this probably, you know, on a, not regularly, but I'll do them occasionally um, as we work to open other programs. So anyway, let's take questions. Um, know that I'm not speaking to you directly. I'm going to, I may say some things about your story, but really I'm trying to take your questions and apply them to everyone so everyone can get something out of this opportunity. So let's go. All right. The first one says, please explain intriguing. Okay. So we use the word intriguing, um, kind of means flirting. Intriguing means, um, I'm kind of looking over my shoulder, looking over somebody's shoulder that I'm talking to, but I'm really not talking to them. I'm kind of looking at the other person and trying to catch their eye. It's the little rush we get, a sex addict in particular, from getting someone to notice up, getting someone's attention, feeling that someone might be attracted to us. It's just the rush. It doesn't always, it often does not get followed through with an act, but it's more about keeping the energy alive, about uh, sort of constantly searching and hunting and, and uh, feeling like I'm desired. Thank you. So I, I mentioned previously, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll keep going. We ran out of time last week and I think the week before that too. So it's great if you can add them earlier in the evening. Um, can you explain the link between sex addiction and narcissism? Mm. I've heard you mention it in the past. My therapist says that while I have narcissistic traits, he would not diagnose me as a narcissist. Well, that's a good thing. <laughs> so let me just say, first of all, that every addict, when they are active in their addiction, is a narcissist. Because if you think about what narcissism is, it's basically saying the world is about me and I'm the one who comes first and everybody else comes second or third. And what I want and what I need is more important than what anybody else or needs or wants. And I'm more important than anyone else in general. And so if you think about an addict who is taking money out of the kid's college fund to get drugs, who's having sex with people that could give him diseases or give his spouse diseases or her, we're not really thinking about anyone else or anything else in our active addiction, but ourselves. That's the nature of addiction. It is a narcissistic disorder. But when people are sober and they're no longer hiding and being secretive and manipulating, and then we, try, try, then we try to figure out what is, what is really problems with relationships, um, intimacy, empathy, remorse, what are those sort of narcissistic things that they might need to look at versus what really had to just to do with their addiction? For example, I know that I am, uh, I can say this, I'm a very attentive husband. I love su surprising my spouse. I love making a little something to eat or leaving something on their pillow when I leave town or just little surprises. Um, I never cared about any of that stuff when I was using or when I was acting out, you know, who had time for that? It was just as long as they didn't look at me funny, I was out the door to have sex. So 
totally narcissistic when in the addiction, but much more available to be present and thoughtful when sober. I also want to say that if you've lived as, a sex, as an active addict in one form or another for a long time, you've lived as a very narcissistic person for a long time. And so these traits come into view, right? Traits that we've learned, traits that are adaptive. Um, Full-on narcissists, honestly, to be really, really truthful, I've treated about a thousand people in my life, give or take. And I would say narcissistic personality disorders, like really profound, maybe I've seen three or four. Um, it really is, when they talk about personality disorders, people are really disturbed, whether it's borderline. But we do have people, especially people with a lot of trauma, who have adaptive traits, survival traits, and they may have gotten us to where we are today. They may not work in the life we want to have going forward. So narcissism is present in all active addicts. Um, it's something that can be unlearned and reprocessed in learning about relationships. In fact, I'll say this, one of the focus, in fact, the focus of any treatment environment that I'm creating um, is relationship intimacy. You know, if you're in a treatment program that I'm running, you're going to be with six or eight guys and you're going to be working on developing relationship intimacy with those men, not sexual intimacy, not romantic intimacy, but really feeling a sense of family and connection and working on your narcissism. You know, if you go to a treatment program, you've got to make the bed every morning or you've got to do the dishes. You know, everyone has a little chore. And if you don't do your chore because you're a narcissist and you say, well, it doesn't matter. I don't want to do that. I'm paying for treatment. If you're doing good treatment, that'll come up in group. The whole group needs to say, wait a minute. We didn't want to sit around with dirty dishes. So treatment itself, treatment itself is a good hard knock on narcissism. Going to 12-step programs, I think, is almost curative because if you really are working a good program, then you can't have the focus be solely on what you want. Everything in 12-step teaches us to be focused on others and supporting others. And so the process of going from being a fairly narcissistic addict to being an empathic, engaged partner doesn't happen because someone gets sober. Um, when they stop acting out or stop drinking and using, that means they are beginning to be available to over time become more empathic, a better partner. It, it takes us time. So we can stop the acting out behaviors reasonably quickly with the right help, but learning how to be an empathic, loving, nurturing partner, that takes work on our part. And that's really what comes after the sobriety. Great answer. So, okay. Um, oops, 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 oops. Sorry. Okay, then the next one, there's some very kind words for both of us. Um, including uh, Dr. Rob, you're genuine, compassionate, and I love how there's no BS. You keep it real. Isn't that nice? You are by far my favorite expert in the field. That's really nice too. Thank you, I appreciate it. All right, so question. My essay husband and I did therapeutic disclosure January 31st of this year with both of our CSATs present. He has been in recovery for nearly a year. I have an extensive trauma history and which includes molestation and several sexual assaults. I found out my husband's worst part of his addiction was watching porn of women getting raped and acted out mm -hmm. online with other women once about raping her. I kept having this intrusive thought that my husband is a rapist, despite the behavior strictly being online. He's never ever been violent with me in any way. In fact, he doesn't express anger either. How do I deal with this? Well, I, I, first of all, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. I'm so sorry you have that history because that will color everything in your life. I know my history always leaves me guessing, did they say that because it was about me or because they were just saying that? Or, you know, we, we sometimes, the issues remain. So, uh, you know, I can't tell you personally, honestly, what's true and what isn't. I think that part of... Um, Part of our recovery, those of us who are surviving trauma, is to really work on our triggers so that when we hear about someone getting raped, when we hear someone did something, in a, you know, something we run into someone who treats us badly or something happens that we really, really know what belongs to the past and what belongs to the present. And that takes time because it could feel the same. I might react to someone with a sense of mistrust. It takes me a while to figure out sometimes, do I mistrust them because they remind me of something that happened in the past? Or do I mistrust them because that's really my gut feeling about right now? So those are what you're asking about are confusing issues for any survivor because we face on a day-to-day -day basis the reminders of the past. But you have a particularly difficult, which is your husband's fantasy um, is something that is violating to you, would be violating to anybody, and it's something that's happened to you. 
And I don't think that that is, there's any way around that, but talking about it with your husband a lot um, in therapy and out, you know, it's that you said you have disclosure and I'm guessing he did not disclose violent or rape history. Um, I'm going to tell you that I don't believe that everything everyone looks at is something that they want to do. I think if people, all the kinds of porn that people looked at, they actually did, we'd have a really bizarre looking world. <laughs> you know, there are just fantasies that people like to have in their heads. And, you know, I, I like your thought about my husband is not assertive and I wish he was more open with me with his anger. And I also like your thought, and I'm kind of carrying it, that people that might have rape fantasies might be very angry people. It doesn't mean that they want to rape somebody, but it may mean that they sexualize their anger in fantasy, like with the porn. So I think that, that you're right on the right track, which is my husband, I need to talk more about him expressing his anger, about him being honest with me about his anger, not withholding, and about what the whole rape thing was about, because I need to know what was your real fantasy and how, you know, those are things you guys need to talk about. And it won't stop you from being triggered, but it will help. Um, and by the way, if you have those kind of trauma triggers, even in the face of a good life, I think EMDR is a particularly good way to deal with very triggering activities. Um, it's a form of therapy that helps deal with trauma triggers. Um, but this is a relationship issue that you guys are going to have to spend a lot of time with. And it isn't just about his fantasy or what happened. It's about the two of you. Thanks, Dr. Rob. Okay. I'm a gay male dating. I feel like sex is brought up very quickly in dating process. How should a person in sexual recovery handle that? Well, um, Listen, we live in a world where people can get on their phone and within three minutes find a sex partner and be across the street or down the block having sex. So, you know, and, and in the gay world, there was always ample room for fast, in the moment, anonymous sex. So, it, and that is because, not because we're gay, by the way, because we're men. And men have a greater capacity to enjoy and look for uh, non-relational sex. So when you have two men together, you have more likelihood that both people will be open to a very anonymous experience. Women tend, healthy women in particular, tend to want to actually know you or have some kind of relationship with you or care about you in some way, unless they're looking for some purely physical sexual experience. Men are more comfortable in general having objectified non-relationship sexual experiences. So you can understand two men together, that's kind of, it's not unusual. So here's the deal. And by the way, I'm going to get to explain intimacy to you at the same time. Um, I think dating is all about letting somebody know who you are and finding out who they are. That's really what dating is. It's not about kissing. It's not about romance. It might get to that. But for us, dating is about just figuring out who someone is. So let me first say what a date is for us. A date is going to an ugly, brightly lit coffee shop in the middle of the day in two separate cars where you meet for an hour to get to know each other a little bit and then you leave in separate cars. And then if that goes well, you might within let's say a week go for a walk somewhere. That's what dating is. It isn't romantic restaurants where we look into each other's eyes for hours. And I will tell you why. Because we get lost in that. We lose, sex and love addicts lose our ability to discern whether someone is healthy for us, whether that's gonna go well or go badly. Um, whether it's even something we should get into when we start with lots of heavy flirtation and have a couple of drinks if you drink and you know it's just we need every every opportunity to reflect back on our behavior and say is this what i've been want to be doing is this good for me so going slow is essential no one should leave you feeling pressured into sex that's not to say that you're not going to meet people who you're attracted to and they're attracted to you and they want to go and you're thinking uh so here's how it works. When someone seems to be a little much too into the smooching, a little too much into the let's get in the dark corner, a little too much into we had a nice meal, let's go to my house. That's when you say, that's when you get really, really intimate. <laughs> and this is a trick because you think intimacy is about sex and romance. No, no, that's not what intimacy is. Intimacy is about being known. So that's when you say to that man, you know, I really don't want to be sexual until we know each other better. And I'd like to have at least a month of dating before we have sex, how would that be for you? And then you get, to, well, first of all, if you don't get finished with the sentences and he's already gone, you know that, that it's not gonna go well. But if he says, wow, you know, I've been wanting to get to know people too, but everyone wants to have sex and I like sex, but if you wanna wait, then you know you got maybe uh, at least a winner or at least in that area. And that gives you time to get to know each other with a little bit more discernment. 
the reason, the other reason you want to have sex right away is because I want you and every person in this room who's single to not make decisions around sex for yourselves. I want you to make them in partnership with your sponsor, with your support group. If you're gonna have sex with someone, if I was gonna have sex with someone and I was dating, I, my support group would already know who I'm dating, know about my dating experiences, know, and know when we, and then they would know that we we're planning on having sex and I'd have to call probably the next morning. You know, it's all, we don't do this alone. And then, then there's no shame. If you make a mistake, it doesn't go well, whatever. You're not alone. There are others. So don't date alone. Alcoholics don't go out in early recovery to bars and clubs on their own because they're going to drink. We don't go on dates because we're going to have sex unless we put down really strong parameters, not because we're prudes, not because we don't want to be sexual, not because we don't find the person attentive or attractive, but because we want to take care of ourselves. And we know we make better decisions around dating when we get the advice of other people who know us well and when we take our time. And if that man doesn't want to date you because you don't want to have sex, he's not the right man for you to be dating. Easy. Um, next question. All righty. Uh, female sex and love addict. I've been doing well in recovery for four months. I got a divorce three years ago, but I've had a hard time cutting him out of my life. He called me in the middle of the night last night, and it was so upsetting. My day has been really emotional as a result. I feel like acting out. But I've contacted my sponsor, and I just watched a movie. I'm realizing I need to protect myself from him. Why is it so hard to disconnect from something that I fully know only upsets me? Well, I'd like to answer that for you. So sometimes when you're a reasonably intelligent person, as I think most of you are, if you're able to find your way here, you're probably pretty smart. We kind of think we know things. We kind of think we know ourselves. We kind of think you know, that we're good at making decisions and all that. And the problem is, is that um, our intellect is often disconnected from our emotions. That's true for everybody, but it's particularly true for us. And so we think, well, that's not really what I want. That's not really what I feel. I know that that's not, that person's not good for me. I'm, re I'm glad I'm out of that. But emotionally, we may still be a little bit connected or we may still think of them warmly or maybe we haven't fully, you know, maybe it'll be years before we fully separate. So listen, if you loved somebody and you're not with them anymore, that doesn't mean you don't still get to think of them with love and longing and missing them and wishing you still have the good times. Let's not forget that you probably had some good times together when we are grieving a loss of relationship when we are moving away from an, an intense, close relationship, we generally don't sit around unless we're really angry at them when we're grieving and think how horrible they were. We more think about how much we miss them. And so, and when we think about what we miss, we miss the good stuff. We don't think about the bad stuff. So here's a, a suggestion for you. I would maybe make some kind of written inventory of the problems that that relationship had and the reasons you left it. So that when you start feeling some of that longing and confusion, and maybe I shouldn't have, that you can go down and look at that list and then call your sponsor, the person you already went through that list with, because sometimes you need a little intellectual reminder of why you made that good decision because emotionally you're feeling like you wish you hadn't. That's just human, you know? And I'm thinking the middle of the night is my most vulnerable time. So answering the phone, answering the phone from a sponsee in the middle of the night is yes. Calling my sponsor in the middle of the night is yes. Asking from an old relationships. I just, you got, don't hang up. I think you can block your phone during, block his number during certain hours. You can yeah. block his number altogether. And, and, and I want to just say this, I, I remember, because this is us, this is those of us who have these issues. I was in a meeting not that long ago and I heard a guy, SLA, sex and love addicts, and I heard this guy say, oh my God, this is exactly what he said. He said, I've just finished dating this woman. She was horrible for me. It was really bad. And I just thinking about her all the time. And I just hope she doesn't call me. I hope she doesn't text me because I don't know if I'm going to be able to not respond. Now, this was a 12-step meeting. I couldn't say anything. But what I wanted to say is block her number. You know. But when you're that person, you don't think about that. Or you think, oh, well, that wouldn't be nice for them. Or this is about you. How do you take care and protect you? You want to call him? Call him. You don't want him to call you unexpectedly? Block his number because that's healthy for you. And that's what you need to do until you're feeling stronger. Certainly during the night. So thanks, Dan.
Okay, next one. Um, this is from someone who had a question last week. One of my biggest issues is that I tend to stare and get mem mesmerized with nothing going on in my head. I found myself staring at this woman on the train who had her eyes closed and all I could do was stare. I wasn't reacting, but I couldn't look away. And when he does look away, anxiety builds and I feel like acting out. Okay, well, I don't know if this is specifically for you, but we have something called the three second rule. And I think it's really basic and really useful. We, uh, the, if you're in this room and you're a sexual love addict, we obsess about people. You know, one of my, and by the way, I remember this is there. I always, when I was younger and I used to go to meetings, there was always, I had a theory of one, which means there will always be one person in the 12 step meeting that I'm attracted to. It oh. doesn't matter if there's nobody attractive in the room, my brain will go to the most attractive person. And I will obsess about that person because I am a sex addict. So, but again, it's like not thinking about blocking the person's number. You know, if I'm staring at someone and I'm feeling uncomfortable with that, what I need to do is get up and move. You know, if you're sitting at a 12-step meeting and someone attractors across the room and you're looking at each other and you're getting lost, get up and go sit on their side of the room where you're not looking across, take an action to take care of yourself. So the easiest one is what we call the three second rule. And I will, I think it applies in this situation. So you look over and you see someone who's attractive or you're interested in, great, give yourself that. I'm human. Uh, I find people attractive. I think that person's attractive or I like their body, whatever that is, that's human. And in the second second, you look away. And in the third second, you say to yourself, I bet that someone's mother, someone's daughter, someone's sister, someone's aunt, someone, I bet that they may have children or somebody who loves them and you humanize, maybe pray for that person if that's what you need to do to be able to see them as a human being. And the fourth thing in this three step, three second rule is don't look back. And if you are sitting across from someone and you've done the three second rule and you think, oh my God, I'm gonna start staring again, then pick your butt out of the chair and move to the next subway car. This is about self care. It's not about um, having the strongest muscles in town. You don't have to like, I'll sit here and I won't look at her and I'll just do the right thing. Just get your ass out of the chair and move, okay? And also be kinder to yourself. We're gonna do this. As long as you didn't go up to her and talk to her and interrupt her and get, get in her face, yeah, it probably got you going some. If you didn't stare, it, you wouldn't get going. So what we're talking about is how to get you out of spending just that extra second or two that gets your brain going into obsession. And, what, and the way to do that is to turn away. Last thing about the three second rule, it is not a waltz. So waltzes go one, two, three, meaning I'm looking, I'm looking away, I'm looking one, two, three, one, two, no, you look away and that's it. It's only three seconds. And then if you can't not continue looking at them, you need to move. Okay. My self image has been poor over the last several months since discovery day. I've been thinking that at some point, someone, ideally my husband would find me sexy again. Is that even possible? Or is this always going to be a lust trigger for my SA husband? Well, Go ahead, Tammy, you, you, you want to say something? Well, I was just thinking, you know, clearly it's a partner and, uh, it, you know, it, it isn't, a, go ahead, it's, it isn't about you, it's about him, so please. Tammy's ahead. having a feeling about this. I, think. I am, so, I feel bad for you that you're feeling that you're not sexy. It, it's got nothing to do with you. Well, here's the deal. Um, sex addicts, those of us who are sex and love addicts, we tend to look for intensity rather than intimacy. So, you know, so I'll ask everybody to think about, I don't know, being, you know, having some date that turned into sex that was amazing or the idea of that. So when you're dating and you're young and you're getting, you know, a lot of it is about, oh my God, I want to have sex with that person. And, and so the way we get to sex with people we don't know well is, is we really focus a lot on, um, I just, oh, I'm sorry, it's completely went out of my head what I wanted to say. So for healthy people early in life will use sex and sexual arousal as a get them into sex. In other words, I like, I like her body, I like her body, I like let's go have sex. And they're looking at the visual or they're looking at the, in other words, it's all very exciting, very hot, very, it's, you know, it, it, that's dating. Dating is about you know, not really knowing someone and getting caught up in the fantasy of who they might be. And so it's woo, moonbeams and sunshine and exciting sex. The problem for us, sex and love addicts, is we think that once we put down our addiction, that we should be attracted to our spouse of 12 years in the same way. In other words, 
what we think will turn us on is, well, what we, what we believe will lead to sex is being horny. Like when I turn around, I look at my wife's butt, who I've been, the same butt I've been looking at for 13 years, but all of a sudden it's going to turn me on in the way that a, a, you know, a 22 year old walking down the street would turn me on. That's not going to happen. Not because your butt isn't like the 22 year olds, although I probably isn't, um, or it might be, but because when you've been with someone for 12 years, you're not going to have that immediate oh, rush of excitement and newness. And so sex addicts in long-term partnerships, and I would write this down, need to come to toward sexuality with their partners, not from a place of horniness, but from a place of willingness. We are often deep down, us sex addicts, fearful about sex, fearful about the intimacy that it brings, fearful about the emotional vulnerability we can show if we're intimate with people. So hot, amazing, heart pounding sex, yeah, we're safe because that's all like moonbeams and starlight and rocket ships and wow, I get lost in that stuff, but really being with someone that I know well and letting myself be vulnerable and letting the sex just come out of our caring for each other, never occurred to me, nobody ever taught me that. I know how to have sex when I'm horny and someone's hot and I'm all over it, but how do I have sex with someone when we're just sitting in bed reading? So here's the answer, you know, Sex that does not come from willing, from horniness, but from willingness means you don't feel like having sex. You're not sure you want to have sex, but you stroke your spouse's hair anyway. They stroke yours. You give each other a massage. You hold hands. You start kissing. All of a sudden, there's arousal and amazing sex. It happens almost every time. The thing is, sex addicts are waiting to start the sex for that, wow, I'm so hot and excited. And that doesn't happen when you're in a 12-year relationship. So it may be that your husband need some lessons in how to become aroused and engaged in sex when it's not like um it, it's not like running into the burning house you know it's more like looking at the pleasant view you know and we just we're not really good at that because we're used to approaching sex from intensity not intimacy and intimacy is something that's scary so it's a it's a and let me just say this too, it's not unusual for couples who've been through sex addiction, recovery, disclosure, all that, to then end up with a sex therapist working on, not sex addiction, but working on how to develop physical intimacy, how to redevelop trust, how to redevelop sexual intimacy, or even develop it for the first time. So for some people, it's lessons that we never learned. Um, so I, I agree with Tammy, I, I would take some time before you dip into It's About Me. And you did a podcast with Dr. Pat Love who is the author of Hot Monogamy. And there, it's a great little book and it's got checklists of here's what I like and here's what, I mean, it's really a helpful starting place to have a conversation. So just a thought. I actually think there is a new 20th anniversary version of Hot Monogamy. Oh, I, is out. I have an old version. So, okay, I'll have to look. You say, never mind. <laughs> I am an old person. So, okay. Um, our friend is back, who is the mid-30s single divorce veteran female, and she says, speaking of narcissists, addicts, etc., what kind of traits do they sniff out in me or other females? I'd like to know so that I can turn off those cues or at least understand that about myself. That's kind of a long question, you know, and I want to try to answer it in a simple way. So I might can tell you the psychological basis for that. But I think I'd rather talk to you about your growth. Um, I, I, if the people you date end up having similar patterns, and we often date people with similar patterns, um, I think the key to dating is to date people that you already know are on some road of self-awareness and self-recovery. So you know that you're often dating narcissistic men who are uh, unempathic and take advantage of you in some way. You want to know why. I think that could take years. <laughs> How about let's do it the other way. Why don't you say what you want in a man and what you don't and how you would know you were getting it, write all that down, figure out who you really want to date, make sure the person you're dating is, is fits into that box. And one of the, I think one of the keys for us, either people who've partnered with sex and love addicts in the past or those who are sex and love addicts, meaning all of us who struggle with intimacy disorders, that's everyone here. Um, it's best for us to, um, um, sorry, just went completely out of my head. Um, it's best for us, what, uh, sorry, my poor brain. It's best for us to, ah, um, 
learn how to date healthy people put inside of that box that I may be attracted to, you know, here's the deal. Let me try this again. I just wrote a book called Prodependence. I've, in the book, there's a chapter called when two, Why Twos Don't Marry Sevens. And I talk about in the book, in Prodependence, how, you know, if you're an emotional two, you're probably going to marry a three. Because if you were looking at a nine, he's way too boring for you. I mean, he has it together and that's boring. And if he's a nine and you're a two, he's going to look at you and say, wow, that person's way too much work. So he's not going to be interested in you either. So inevitably, we're going to date people at our own emotional level. And we will date people that mirror some of our vulnerabilities. So if you have a vulnerability to someone, I don't want to say, let's just say using you in a way that they come first, then you, know, you already know that about yourself. So make sure that the men you are dating are, are aware that they themselves, it, how do I say this, are aware of themselves. So date the alcoholic, but make sure he's in recovery. Date the narcissistic guy, but make sure he's in really good therapy and he's aware that he has narcissistic traits. It's not that you can avoid dating people who will mirror some of our vulnerabilities, that's inevitable. But you can avoid dating the person who is not growing who has still stuck in the mire, you don't have to date the, uh, yet another narcissistic loser. You can at least date one of us narcissists who's working on ourselves. <laughs> and then you know what my belief about couples is? That if you're a two and you marry a three together, you can get to be a five or a six, like as a couple. That's sort of the whole idea behind pro -dependence. So, Very helpful. Okay. Um, so... <laughs> Here's one. I really want to see an escort again because I miss the physically closeness, not just the sex. I keep telling myself that it's just cuddling session with no sex and that it's okay. I'm having, I'm trying to get through this. What do you think? Is this my shadow fault self rationalizing the addiction? Yes, it is. We all have skin. Yes, period. I could stop right there. Yes. I know that's like, Of course. That's like saying, you know, oh, I really miss alcohol. I like the way it smells. I like the way it makes me feel, you know? So if I just, why, what's wrong with thinking about it? I'm not, it's not like I'm drinking. It, it, what you're doing is you're romanticizing the idea of acting out and that will lead you to acting out. So I think you're on dangerous ground with this question. But let me answer your question. We all have great need to be touched. It's part of the human condition. Um, it's part of, from birth to womb to tomb. We, we need that, but we don't need it at, as a part of sex, we just don't. So guess what, if you go to a lot of meetings, you're gonna get a lot of hugs. You go to fellowship after and coffee after, you're gonna get even more hugs. You have some of those 12 step people, your therapy group folks over for a card game on a Saturday night, more hugs. You want more physical touch? Find a really unattractive, under no way would you in any way be sexually attracted to this person who's not even of the gender you're interested in, who gives massage. Someone there's no way, no matter what, you would ever want them to be sexual with you and get a massage twice a week. If you want to be touched, there are lots of ways to be touched that don't involve sex. And you can get your physical needs. I had a massage therapist here that I I went to Massage Envy for a while, you know, just because it had a good deal and it was signed up for six sessions. And this woman was so just, we had nice conversations. I enjoyed her company. She stretched me and made me feel good. And you know, I knew that nothing was going to happen because I'm gay and she was a woman. So, you know, find somebody you're not attracted to and get touched, but not genitally touched. Not, you know, it's just, you can get your needs met without that. And, and the more you're aware of the need, great. The lonelier, the more needful you are, but that doesn't mean to go back to old behavior. It, it's just a signal that you're not taking care of yourself now. And I think that's just that's the one more thing I want to say. Many, many sex addicts know what they should not be doing. I shouldn't look at porn. I shouldn't call ex-boyfriends. I shouldn't go online for whatever. We're very good at knowing what to not do if we're being honest with ourselves, but not doing things, not doing things is not, how do I, as a double negative, I don't heal by not doing things. I simply get sober by not doing things. I heal by pushing myself to be out in the world and starting to enjoy my life, enjoying people, enjoying relationships, enjoying touch, sitting at home alone, miserable and wishing I was acting out. You might as well be acting out because that's no way to live, you know, but that's up to you. Um, but this is getting your needs met, very valid, taking responsibility for it and going out and doing it, yours. If you end up acting out over it, it simply means you didn't take care of yourself. You didn't get that need met. So the next one's a little bit longer. A, thera 
therapeutically disclosed to my wife last year. We did not work with a couples counselor post disclosure. I think the shock of wrapping her around her mind around all that I did throughout our marriage made it impossible to move forward with me. Now we are formally separated. I'm moving out of the house at the month's end. She has said that she thinks she is on the way to divorce and she doesn't see the likelihood of reconciliation in the short or long term. She also said that I shouldn't wait around for her and that I should avoid bringing a woman around our sons unless it's serious. I accept the dissolution of my marriage is all my fault. I'm still receiving counseling from my CSAT therapist and making great progress, etc. Re, uh, uh, regarding childhood covert emotional incest, sexual abuse, abandonment for the first time in my life, I understand what happened to me. Should I accept the, that based on her words, we are for all intents and purposes divorced or should I wait until she goes through her process to an inevitability and says the words, I need a divorce before I move on? Well, I don't know what moving on means. Um, so I feel, I hear like two issues conflated here and maybe Tammy, you can help me. Is this person talking about when can I start dating, meeting other people, putting this aside or more, when can I give up on the hope that we might reconcile? Which one do you think? And is? I think it's both because the, the wife is clearly giving the, just don't bring this person around our right. sons. So there's a little bit of that, but also, um, you know, I do hear a little bit, you, you know, should I hold out? Right. Until, you know, she says- and How long have they been course. separated or does it say um, uh, Let's see, we did a disclosure um, it doesn't say exactly when, so, but I think, okay. I, think well, I remember this has been a little bit of time and moving out at the end of the month. So let, let me just say this to you. Um, I remember my, um, I remember when a relationship, when a really important relationship I had ended and I moved out and um, I thought I was fine. I mean, I was bummed, I was sad, I was, but I thought I'd be fine. And, and then about four months later, I fell apart because, so you're two years separated. Thank you for telling us that. Okay. You know, I, I think that, so from what I hear you saying, I think there's some grieving to do. Um, and I, in some ways I would have encouraged you maybe to consider it longer. I mean, a year of separation, you might get back together two years, probably not so likely. And this sounds very inevitable. So I think that you, I think you should respect what your wife has to say and her clarity. And you know, I don't know that you need to say it's 100% my fault. I don't know that fault and blame really matters at this moment. It's nobody's fault. It's everybody's fault. It just is what it is. This relationship did not work for whatever reason, and that's very sad. There are many partners who stay with us despite the drama and the trauma. So, you know, I'll tell you this. It is not, in my opinion, and I've been doing this work for a while, couples that break up over sex addiction, cheating, and these issues, this may sound extreme, but it's been my experience. Most of you were gonna break up anyway. Most of the couples that I work with that have a lot of intact connection, a lot of intact relationship, a lot of intact meaning, they still hold on to that despite the pain, despite the hurt, despite the anger. But couples that were already kind of on the edge anyway, this just throws them right over. And um, I think about 85% of our couples that I've worked with stay together, close, maybe closer to 90. And the ones that don't, in my experience, often were never going to, something else was going to come up or they were already um, done. And so, you know, I think blame is not necessary. I think remorse is better recognized as part of grief, like what's my part and how can I grow? Um, but I don't think that you should be dating anytime soon, to be honest with you. I think, it, you, you know, from the moment you are actually divorced or separate or that thing, that period comes at the end of the sentence, you need six months. Going to, and, and there may be some more grieving in there that you didn't expect. So I wouldn't be thinking about dating at all myself, and I wouldn't recover it to recommend it to a sponsee. Um, but I would be thinking about grief and what do I have to grieve and learn and grow from what's happened. Uh, he also mentions that he has moved to, I missed it. Um, oh, uh, recently relocated to West Indies where there is nothing in terms of CSAT, SAA groups, et cetera. I need a sponsor who can assist me via email or Skype in my recovery journey. So yes, there are drop-in groups and there are more being added. And I would highly encourage you to connect on the drop-in groups and just ask if somebody's willing to be a sponsor on those. There, there are people with solid um, recovery that are plugging into those 
um, groups. So I think you can find a safe sponsor in those groups. So if you go to sexandrelationshiphealing.com, you'll see the list of the current and future to be added um, drop-in groups, including another porn addiction group that is going to be added on um, Sunday evenings and another partner group on Sunday evenings. So we're we're going to continue to add. So. And let me just say briefly, the drop-in group is not like this. It is a room where whether you share with your camera not seen or you are seen, it's a group where everybody's seeing each other and everyone's talking to each other. Um, you know, we've done and our best. And it's not recorded. And it all, and it's not recorded. And there's a therapist in the room monitoring to make sure that what happens is healthy. So most of those are volunteer. And we're, of course, you know, we're not charging you. So yeah, I mean, my recommendation, and I'm, it's a big thing for me these days, is take advantage of everything that's available online. On intherooms.com, there's an SAA meeting every Friday evening, and then I'm on right after that. Um, SLAA has online meetings. SAA has online meetings. Um, you know, you can go to our site and get go to a drop-in group, get a sponsor. So, you know, I understand how important it is to be connected to people in real time, but spend some time seeing how much support you can get online, and you'd be surprised how good it feels. Um, I've really found that for a lot of people. And some people have... I know have started in-person meetings and they've gone and showed up with their big book and they spent the time there. And, you know, eventually some of those have gotten to be really strong traditional meetings. So lots of ways to get that done. Okay. My partner and I are both seeing different sex addiction therapists. His therapist is telling him that he and I are both codependent. I know not necessarily as it relates to sex addiction, but she used the term multiple times. I know you are strongly opposed to the use of that term. Can you elaborate and explain the difference between codependence and prodependence? And I'm like, well, I you have very limited time because nor he does an hour long presentation on this. So um, wait, so let me just say this about what you were talking about. Um, there's a difference between doing codependent, calling every partner of an addict codependent and assuming they have pathology and because they married an addict and they're with an addict and now you, they need addiction treatment too because they, you know, that, that's codependence. But what Speak talked about here, I think it's just a, a name. For example, um, if this therapist said, you guys seem really enmeshed, how would that fit? Meaning you're kind of up in each other's business too much you do a little too much caretaking, he does a little too much worrying, you don't let each other have enough space, um, you're just a little bit too connected. And you need, you know, some people would say, oh, that is a very codependent relationship. They don't support, they're overly supportive of each other. They don't let each other grow. They're smothering each other, that kind of thing. And I wouldn't use the word codependent. I would say it's an enmeshed relationship, it's a smothering relationship. I would use other words. So maybe, and I think that is a little different than codependency in terms of like 12 step meetings. And so I would ask the therapist, is another word you can use? I'm not a big fan of codependency, but can you help me? Because just so you know, codependency is not a psychological term. It's a pop culture term. It's never been a diagnosis. It doesn't, there are 400 books on the topic, but it isn't really a thing. So what does the therapist mean? Do they mean that you enable each other's problems and you need to be more separate? I, I would delve more into that. It may mean not mean that she's looking at you as a codependent. It may just mean that's her label or his label for the way that you, way that you relate that is, seems unhealthy to them. And Tammy's right, there is a prodependency, first of all, there's a website, uh, prodependence.com, where you can find out a lot about the theory. And just to back up a second, I wrote a book a year ago that came out last fall about trying to find a new way to support families and partners, parents and children of addicts which does not um, pathologize the family members and the partners. In other words, I don't think there's anything wrong with you guys. I think you married us and you loved us and you did the best you could and we fall apart and you follow us right into the rabbit hole. And then, you know, you get, a lot, you get pretty dirty and messy in that hole and we, you need a lot of support getting out of it, but that doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. And it doesn't even mean there's something wrong with you for having married us. But what it does mean is you married someone who, for whatever reasons, ended up failing emotionally, and you tried to make us better and you couldn't. And so you, got to, you ended up being a mess too. I don't see that that's pathology. I think that's loving someone and trying to get them better. Um, so I would explore more the meaning of that word to your therapist rather than worrying about what the word is. So there's a, a follow-up. She said it's because he manages my medications and supplements and manages my calendar. I think that's what she meant. So here's another thought for you. Um, one of the things, so 
I'm not a big fan of independence, not my favorite word, because I truly believe that we are best in interdependent relationships where we support each other. I don't need to be strong all the time. I want to be strong when I need to be strong and especially to support my spouse where they're, where they're vulnerable, but then maybe they can be strong in moments when I need to be vulnerable. And I don't think relationships are about two perfect people who are doing every, I think that, you know, we lean into each other's strengths. We lean into each other's vulnerabilities. If you are crappy at organizing your medicine and you take it at the wrong time, maybe you're a little, have a little tension deficit and you, how amazing is that, that this is pro-dependent? How amazing is it that your, your husband is kind enough to make sure that you get the right meds at the right time and he's willing to take time out of his day to do that for you? I think that's lovely. You know, um, my partner has ADD. There are things that just don't get done in this house. I do the dishes. I do the dishes because he spaces out. He, does, he just doesn't, and I need them done. So you could say, well, I'm really codependent. I should sit around and wait for him to get to the dishes. I want them done. So I get them done, and, but I don't sit around and resent him for not doing them. I take responsibility for the level at which I, I want things to work. And if it's something I need to have more control over, I don't blame him for not doing it. I do it. So I don't think relationships are 50-50 ever. You know, they're always 30, 40, 40. I mean, they're always going like this. And so I'm trying to turn over the idea of codependency and say, wait a minute, there's a lot of health, healthiness here inside of our attachments. And let's see how we can look at them as strengths rather than problems. So, you know, if you can do your meds by yourself and you should be doing your meds by yourself and there's no reason why you can't, you always got it right and you have plenty of time to do it. Why is he doing that for you? If you forget them and you're a little spacey and it's really important you take that blood pressure med and you're kind of nuts at the end of the day, if you don't do it, let him put the meds out for you and tell the therapist to shut up, in my opinion. I think that's the no BS that somebody was referring to. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> okay. My essay husband is in recovery attending a sexaholics meeting each week. He has only gone for two months, and while he's enthusiastic about the group, I learned that he lied to them about how long he has been sober. I discovered a relapse at the end of October of 18. He told the group he has been clean since late 2017. How in the heck can he be in recovery and still be a practicing liar? When does the lying ever end, or, or can it when lying is compulsive? It crushed my belief that he is truly in recovery. Yeah, well... You got one for that, Tam? That's a very difficult question. It is. My only thing is I've been around the meetings long enough to know that people lie about their time. They want to get a chip. They want to do whatever. And they, they want, want to, to have it. A, yeah, I was going to say, they want to have this aura of like, I'm getting better. And so um, what I've also found is for the people that stick around, a lot of them have come clean. They, you know, they've been, this is mm -hmm. not okay. And I have to you know, I have to fess up and I have to go back and I have to start, you know, I have to say, well, my, you know, my recovery date is October of 18, you know? And so, so I hear what you're saying and I understand how crushing it feels, you know, to you. Um, and I don't know if you're in therapy and if you can bring it up in front of the therapist that, you know, he's lying about this or whatever, but at, at the end of the day, if he keeps going, if he starts, if he's got a sponsor, if he's really working a program, mm -hmm. cause just going to a meeting is just, you know, parking your butt in a chair and really, you know, it's just, it's not that much. It's helpful, but you really have to engage with other people. Like Rob talked about, you know, it's making connections, getting a sponsor, you know, it's doing the stuff, it's doing the work. If he hasn't um, done sex addiction 101 in the workbook, that would be helpful. Cause you know, it helps you break through all the lying and it, a recovery program is all about honesty. And, you know, so it is, it, it's because we don't know how to be honest. It teaches us how to be honest. So if he keeps going to meetings, you know, it, hopefully, eventually it starts thinking. I, I want to add to that too. I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse. And it's a book for men who have cheated on a woman who don't seem to be able to understand why she hasn't forgiven him, why he isn't saying the right things, why she's still mad at him, why he is, they're not able to get over this. Men often don't really understand the intricacies of, I believe, a woman's pain, just to put it really simply. And, you know, we think like, oh, well, I got a blowjob in Vegas and I didn't know the person and it has nothing to do with my marriage, but boy, if we come home and you find out, it's like, well, what about me? What about the kids? What about the We don't understand as men often, especially sex addicts, 
how our behavior has truly affected you, even when you tell us. We still think, well, I've sober 90 days, all the guys were cheering about my chip. How come you're not happy I got 90 days? And your answer should be like, because you've been cheating on me for 12 years and 90 days doesn't mean anything to me. And you're right to say that because that's where you're at. And you, so um, I think there are certain signs that start to show up when you're someone who's really in recovery, you start to see that they are anticipating your needs. They're anticipating the relationships needs. They're thinking ahead. They're not coming home 20 minutes late and expecting that you would just put up with it. They're home early or they call, you know, there's some relationship qualities, awareness of how you've been harmed, a more of a willingness to be attentive. And that's why I wrote Doghouse. I wrote other Doghouse for you to read, to say, oh, well, this is what it would look like if he was really helping me rebuild trust. He would be doing these things. And then when you realize that he's not, and you really get a good picture, you take the book and you throw it at him. And you say, if you really want my love back, do this. Because him understanding what you're going through on a deeper level, hopefully, will evoke a greater desire in him to make it right. And hopefully he'll realize that sobriety is not just about him. You know, it's about the relationship and everything that you have together. So um, I agree with Tammy. It is a process of trust and faith. As long as he's showing up and doing the right thing, you know, I wouldn't necessarily sleep with him, but I would keep the, uh, the, I would keep the relationship possibilities open. Well, and I think what I think the out of the doghouse book would be great too. But I think what he doesn't understand is, you know, it's not compartmentalized. You know, I only lied about this, you know, but I'm not lying about this. So you well, that's in well, doghouse actually. Yeah, it's it like, is. Yeah. Because guys will say, well, I I always put the check in the bank. I always pick the kids up on time. I you know, it's only the sex. It's only as if as if because this is what we're thinking as uh, sex addicts. Well, you can trust me in every other area except with women and, and acting out. Other than that, I'm sorry, you can't parse trust. You either trust someone or you don't. So they're thinking they're still pretty trustworthy except for this. And you're thinking, I don't trust a word that comes out of the person's mouth. And that's a big gap. So there's a lot of understanding that needs to be filled in in the process. Anyway, I think we have time for maybe you one. Uh, we'll see. We've got seven, six minutes now. So let's see. Okay. Um, another man's sexual conquest and hooking up fills me with anxiety and the urge to act out. The biggest thought that I can catch is that I'm not attractive enough for women to want to open up to uh, or show interest. When one of my SAA group members speaks about how much they got laid in college, I feel inferior and ugly and unwanted. I don't know how to process these thoughts. Hmm. Well, um, I relate to this in a slightly different way than you. And I just want to say it because it's what comes up to me when I see, I mean, and this is for me, narcissism. When I see someone who's a man who is more attractive and younger than me, I start to compare myself and think, Oh, well, I wish I looked like that. I wish I was that age. I wish, I wish, I wish. And in doing that, I kind of drip out and disappear because all I am is the longing for something that I'm not. So, I'm not sure that that's exactly the same, but I think the idea of looking at people, hearing about their experience and comparing their outsides to your insides is what is the problem. You know, I, 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 I would imagine there's something in your past about, and I'm just guessing with dad or some way that you learned that, you're, that you were not enough. Um, and I know for me that came out of not having family members who showed a lot of pride in me. There wasn't a lot of good for you, son, I'm proud of you, you did a good job. You know, I just didn't get that. And when you have to make that stuff up when you're a kid, you know, it just only goes so far. And so our self-esteem suffers. I will say this to you, if, if you can begin to do, uh, Tammy's gonna jump on me for this in a good way. I think if you want more self-esteem, do esteemable things. Instead of looking at the guy who's had great sex with 300 women saying, wow, he's this and I'm that, go volunteer and help somebody who doesn't have a meal. You know, go help in an orphanage, orphanage so some kids can get clothing. You know, give something of yourself. Because I think when we're looking at the world in terms of deficits, one, we can be depressed. And two, we can also um, be not doing, doing enough things to, bolt, to make us feel better. Real things you know, like doing service, because there's nothing 
like having given something away just because you could to make you feel like the best person in the whole world. And you know what? I don't care how many women that guy slept with. If you can help somebody have a better day today, you're the man for me or you're the person I'm going to cheer for. Um, and how you got to putting yourself down around those particular issues, I think that's a therapy issue. I agree. And I love, like you said, that, you know, get out of myself and go do something that um, is going to help others for no other reason than I want to help others. Not because somebody's going to go, oh, you're such a nice person. It's just because I want to help people. The other thing I was thinking was, and you're both in the same meeting. So it doesn't really matter, right. you know, at the end of the day, however many people you slept with or not, at the end of the day, you're both in a meeting you know? And so there, you have more alike than not. That's right. So it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, it like, you know, in AA, it isn't, well, you drank that and I did this. It doesn't matter. We're still here because we both had problems. And so, you know, if we can learn from each other rather than comparing of my deficits, but like, what is it that I'm hearing that I can relate to and how can I how can it help my recovery? That's a much better framework for me than, um, than compare and contrast in a negative way. And I really think, and Tammy, I know you agree with this, there's this wonderful saying in AA about not comparing my insides to your outsides. And I think on some level, that's exactly what you're doing. You're listening to the outside. I mean, you have no idea how miserable, horrible, how, how unhappy that person's life may be. You're just focusing on the part that you believe you're not. And that's, looking at your vulnerabilities through the lens, through a distorted lens, because you're not, you know, just like a sex addict doesn't see, really see the person, they see a butt, they see boobs, they see, you know, we're not really looking at the human being. In a way, you're doing that to yourself here. You're not looking at yourself as a whole person, and you're not looking at that person as a whole person. You're just pulling out the one thing that will make you feel worse about yourself and saying, darn it, there it is again. There are, there's a much broader way to focus on what people are saying than simply what you lack. Um, and I think that's, and I would also consider looking at depression. I would want to know yeah. because depressed people do a lot of this. Yeah, that makes sense too. And go see a professional so that you get the help you, that you need. So at 5.59, which is the time, I'm going to yeah. call time because I want to just tell you guys something. Um, I just finished, I think, something like our 40th podcast. And a couple of things happened. Last week we were nominated uh, top 10 addiction podcast for this year. So Sex, Love, and Addiction was a top 10 addiction podcast. Um, I have some of the, I think, the leading names in the psychotherapy and addiction field. Friends I've had or uh, people I've spoken with or written books with or really cool people. Some of you asked about how to, what is a relationship really about? Well, I think the best podcast I've ever done, what, what a relationship is about, is with Stan Tatkin. On a, and he wrote a book called We Do. Today, I did an amazing podcast. A friend of mine named Enid Gray wrote, just wrote a book about neglect. And wow, you want to talk about a, a neglected topic? Um, we talk a lot about being beaten, a lot about being hit, a lot about being abused, a lot about being stuck. We always sort of and point out just what it's about this to um, I think it's survivors and maybe for some spouses as well. Um, everyone should consider reading We Do, We Do uh, by Dr. Tackin if you want to really understand, I think, what a relationship means in the broadest sense. But most of all, um, I think er there's a little piece for everyone there. Um, so do stop in the podcast because they're free. The website is free. Or my blogs are free. Um, we're intending to give as much away as we can. And we start opening treatment programs, I think in April, and hopefully some of you will want to do that. And we'll be glad to uh, give you the best care that we can. So Tam, any final wonderful words for everybody? I, I concur on uh, Enid Gray's book on neglect because it's always the framework of neglect, like the really terrible, you know, no food, no clothing, whatever. And there were all the little nuances that I wouldn't have considered neglect and it kind of hit me between the eyes. So a really mm -hmm. helpful book. I think people will know. You know so, Tammy, yeah. I thought of you when she and I were talking today because, and I won't say Tammy's particular situation, but she went through scenarios where neglect is likely to occur. Yes. And there are things like when you have more than five kids and, and there's just no way that all the kids, you know, when you have a very sick family member and all the attention goes to that family, when you've got a, an alcoholic or a drug addicted or a mentally ill parent, and it's situations that are so wonky 
that your needs just don't get met and they don't get identified. And, and sometimes you can't even really blame your caregivers. It's just the way it was. So Right. Yeah, there are situations. So Anyway, yes. love you folks. Please let us continue to support you. It's supportive to us. I love doing this work. And hopefully I'll see you Friday on In the Rooms or you'll run into some one of us in uh, online at Section Relationship Healing this week. Yeah. Thank you for your time. More Thanks for doing this. this. Week too. Thank you, Dr. Rob. Bye. Oh, wait, one more thing. What? I'm okay. going to be in Chicago all week. I'm speaking at two different conferences. If any of you live in Chicago, come visit. I'm speaking at the Opioid Addiction Conference on Tuesday, tomorrow. i got to get to Chicago and speak. And then Thursday, I'm speaking at a Mindfulness Recovery uh, conference in, in, uh, in Chicago. So I'll be all over Chicago this week. If yes, anybody... if, and sexandrelationshiphealing.com are the details. And it's cold there, so wish me warm vibes. Thanks. Definitely. Bye, Thank guys. Thank you.